Brain-Computer Interfaces, or BCIs, are a technology that uses brain or nervous system data to control computers or machines. BCIs may allow us to interface with computers, media, and robotics just by thinking about it. They could even allow us to meld our minds with a computer and could potentially change the course of human evolution. Hi, I'm Colin Fosnott with the BCI Guys, and today we're going to talk about how brain-computer interfaces work. Nearly all of the BCI technologies that have been developed to date are within the medical realm. Generally, BCIs have been developed for people that have limited communication or motor capabilities. And this makes sense. In the field of BCIs, you have to justify the potential benefit of the technology over the cost of installation, usability of the device, device maintenance, and the health of the user. If a technology requires brain surgery and a brain chip to be implanted, there's obviously a very high cost to not only undergoing the surgery, but preventing complications such as scar tissue from forming. On the flip side of that coin, if we use a non-invasive BCI, like EEG, the potential benefits aren't all that high. The many biological layers that muddy the signals for EEGs can distort and lower the usefulness of these devices for accomplishing real-world tasks. Because of this, BCIs tend to be either semi-invasive or offer unique invasive procedures that mitigate any potential harm to the user. But there are still risks associated with these procedures. So it makes sense that the primary users are those that struggle immensely due to their own physical limitations and absolutely need to use a BCI to interact with the world or communicate. But medical use cases are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to taking full advantage of neurotechnology. There are already a large number of uses for brain-computer interfaces outside the medical field, ranging from improvements to virtual reality systems and video games to military applications. As this technology advances and becomes easier to use, it's very likely that we'll see it grow from a hobbyist technology, such as personal computers in the 70s and 80s, to widespread use, like PCs today. There are three main components of a BCI system. The physical hardware that acquires signals from the brain, the software component, which processes the data into something that a computer can understand, and the generation of an action in a computer or machine. For the scope of this course, we don't have time to go through all the ins and outs of machine learning and signal processing. However, we will briefly go over these topics and discuss why they are useful and how they are generally applied. No matter what neurotechnology you're using, you're going to encounter a lot of noise. Noise refers to random or unwanted electrical signals that distort the signals you're attempting to capture. Most neurotechnology used for brain-computer interfacing works with very small electrical signals, which originate from the brain's nervous system. These signals are generated from action potentials that are fired when two neurons communicate with one another. Due to the minute scale of these action potentials, competing electrical signals both inside and outside of the body, such as a heartbeat or even a nearby power source, may create noise. This is where filtering comes in. Filtering of BCI signals can be done either at a hardware or software level, and the general idea behind it is to get rid of signals that are non-neurological in origin. There are many types of filters that are used within BCI applications. One of the most commonly used is the bandstop filter. The bandstop filter is useful because it can be used to remove a specific frequency band from the data. One of the most commonly used bandstop filters is the notch filter, which removes the 60 Hz frequency band from data. In the United States, power lines operate at 60 Hz. This filter is used to remove any noise that the power line may be generating from the neurological data. Filtering isn't the only technique that we can use to improve our understanding of brainwave data. In order to make the most out of the data that we filtered, we must then use certain algorithms to extract meaningful information. For most large-scale brain-computer interfaces, we need to use machine learning. Here's an oversimplified example of how this would work. Let's imagine that we want to create a BCI system that allows the user to move a cursor in four directions on a screen. Up, down, left, and right. We would ask the user to imagine each of these actions individually in a large set of trials while recording their brain data. We would then mark on the data where each trial started and stopped, and later look at all of the data points that have been recorded. If we tell the computer, for example, in these 50 trials the person is imagining moving to the right, the computer could find patterns in this data. From these patterns, the computer can generate a sort of signature that can be used when observing the data in real time later. 
If it sees a signal pattern emerge that is close enough to that signature, it will then execute an action. In this case, it would move the cursor to the right. So generally, brain-computer interface data must be filtered before being used in practical applications. Then, when we have the data that's relatively clean, we can train computers to recognize certain patterns to accomplish different tasks. This is how many BCIs have accomplished incredible feats such as full articulation of fingers in a robotic prosthetic. But what exactly does the data that we're feeding into these algorithms look like? What do all those squiggly lines represent? And how do we discern meaning from them? When we use a brain-computer interface, there are generally two important bits of information that we're trying to extract. The frequency at which the brain waves are firing, the generated from action potentials, and the time at which those brain waves fire, or when the action potentials occurred. The latter is generally referred to as a time series. In a nutshell, the time series is a bunch of data graphed over points in time. The time series may also be referred to as the time domain and is useful in determining when an event has occurred in research and medical applications. Information within the time domain may also be useful for predicting when an event is about to take place, as certain patterns may emerge leading up to an event such as a seizure or an imagined motor task. Another way to help us analyze brain waves is with the help of the frequency domain. The frequency domain allows us to figure out which rates certain groups of neurons may be firing within the brain. It can generally help us understand how neurons within the brain are working together or against one another. When combined with the time domain, the frequency domain has helped scientists discover things like how the motor system within the brain works, and how signals propagate through certain areas of the brain to accomplish complex tasks such as vision or audition. Using the frequency domain, we have been able to make a few important discoveries about the brain. We discovered certain frequencies in which neurons fire. We call these frequencies brain waves, and they are separated into delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma waves. When these neurons are fired together, they are considered synchronized. The strength of these brain waves are a result of how many neurons are currently in synchronization. The combination of certain brain waves in different areas of the brain may indicate an event is taking place. For example, certain frequencies of alpha waves called mu rhythms are generated from the motor areas of the brain when the body is at rest. These waves are generally between 9 and 11 hertz, and the suppression of these brain waves, more specifically referred to as desynchronization, indicates when a person moves part of their body. So, the desynchronization of the mu rhythm over the part of the motor cortex that controls a person's left arm may indicate left arm movement. Now that we've discussed the different domains that we can analyze BCI data in, it's important that we draw a distinction between the two different ways in which we can use this data, asynchronously or synchronously. Generally, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous BCIs is that synchronous BCIs rely on unconscious signals, while asynchronous BCIs rely on signals that are deliberately evoked. Keep in mind that this is just a general rule of thumb though, it may differ depending on the situation. Asynchronous BCIs typically rely on the user deliberately doing a task in order to execute an action. Asynchronous BCIs are also sometimes referred to as self-paced BCIs. Users must voluntarily initiate controls without some sort of external stimulus for a BCI to be considered asynchronous. These types of devices are very useful for individuals suffering from disabilities, as they can be used to provide people who are normally unable to move a means to communicate with the outside world. One of the most common asynchronous BCIs are robotic prosthetics. Many advanced robotic prosthetics are driven by the motor areas, which handle voluntary movement. These types of interfaces require that the user imagine moving a limb in order to activate the prosthetic. This process is referred to as motor imagery, and is one of the most common uses within brain-computer interfacing. Once the user thinks about moving their arm, a desynchronization in the mu rhythm band over the motor area occurs. As we mentioned before, Desynchronization refers to the suppression of a specific frequency of brainwaves. A BCI which observes this event is then able to activate the robotic prosthetic, allowing the user to grip objects or even articulate individual fingers. Another common asynchronous BCI relies on conditioned responses in order to accomplish tasks. In some of the earliest demonstrations of brain-computer interfaces, conditioned responses were utilized to encourage a monkey to activate a specific set of neurons within their brain to receive a reward. After several trials, the monkey learned to move a needle on an analog meter past a certain threshold value by manually increasing the firing rate 
a select group of neurons. In a later study, human subjects were able to control the strength in specific frequency bands of EEG signals. In these experiments, subjects were taught to move a cursor on a computer screen by modulating a group of neurons in the frontal cortex of the brain. They literally used their thoughts to move something on a screen. Conditioned responses have also been used in several toys, including a game where players must modulate their brain waves to move a ball up and down with a fan. Finally, population vector encoding is an asynchronous PCI technique that can be used, primarily in invasive systems, to discern specific directional motor commands. This is based on the principle of population coding, which, if we remember back to lesson three, is the finding that the movement generation process can be determined by observing a population of neurons that provide a representation of direction. Basically, specific populations of neurons represent which direction you're planning on moving. For a BCI system, this can be detected as a decrease in mu rhythms in the human brain. This change in brain waves can be detected, recorded, analyzed, and eventually used to control systems that require a high degree of specificity, such as controlling a complex brain-controlled prosthetic, an exosuit, or a virtual avatar. Asynchronous BCIs are helpful when you're looking for a specific action that a participant is consciously evoking. In contrast, synchronous BCIs are used to measure and utilize signals that a participant may not have conscious control over. This can range from brainwave patterns which are evoked while sleeping to visual brainwave patterns in response to a flashing light. Synchronous BCIs may also be referred to as stimulus-based BCIs. The P300 signal refers to a positive deflection in an EEG signal that happens roughly 300 milliseconds after a stimulus. The stimulus is usually unpredictable, but is somewhat related to whatever is being studied. For instance, a subject may focus their vision on a particular flashing light, among many other flashing lights. The signal is typically measured most strongly over the parietal lobe, which suggests that P300 has something to do with measuring the process of decision-making. Steady-state visually evoked potentials, shortened to SSVEP, is a visually evoked potential, which is generated by a visual stimulus. Brain signals from the visual centers should peak when a subject is looking at a light which flickers at a specific frequency. For example, imagine a machine which has two lights flashing at different frequencies one at 6 Hz and one at 9 Hz. If the subject's brain activity is monitored, specifically the subject's occipital lobe, which is the visual center of the brain, this area will emit brain waves at the same frequency of light that a person may be looking at. If you're looking at a light that's flashing at 6 Hz, your occipital lobe will emit waves at 6 Hz. If you then look at the 9 Hz light, your occipital lobe will emit brain waves at 9 Hz. These signals can be picked up by a brain-computer interface and used to evoke a command or for study. The N100 response occurs 100 milliseconds after an unpredictable stimulus occurs. It is a negative going potential, which means the signal dips below the baseline. It typically appears over the frontal and central regions of the head. The N100 response may occur when a subject experiences a sudden noise that they themselves do not create. The N100 is not limited to auditory stimuli, however. It also could occur for visual, olfactory, or somatosensory stimuli. The N400 response is another negative going potential, which occurs roughly 400 milliseconds after a stimulus. It is typically observed over the central and parietal sites of the head. The N400 response is related to visual and auditory processing of language, and occurs when a subject experiences an unexpected ending to a sentence, or other unexpected placements of words. For example, the N400 will be evoked when a sentence like, I take coffee with cream and dog, is said, but not when a sentence like, he returned the book to the library, is said. The N400 may occur when words are presented visually, auditorily, or through sign language. It may also occur for other meaningful stimuli, such as an unexpected expression on another person's face. In this video, we discussed at a basic level how brain-computer interfaces work. We discussed filtering, machine learning, and we talked about both the time and frequency domains. In our next video, Harrison will dive deeper into common applications of brain-computer interfaces and how they may be used in the future.